My name is Mark McGuinness, and this is the 21st Century Creative, the podcast that helps you thrive as a creative professional amid the demands, the distractions, and the opportunities of the 21st century. Welcome to episode three of season four. Today, I'm delighted to welcome best-selling children's author Nadia Shireen to the show. One of the nice things about having a podcast is I get to indulge my own curiosity about different artists and their work and ask the questions that have been hovering in my mind since I first read somebody's book or I saw their painting or I, I heard their music or whatever it is. And today is one of those occasions. Having read Nadia's books with my children, I had some questions about one book of Nadia's in particular, and her answers opened up a really interesting perspective on creativity. So this is one of those interviews where we get to examine a particular art form in close-up, in this case, the children's picture book. And by doing so, we learn things about the creative process that are applicable to other creative fields as well. On a personal note about my own writing, last month I went to London to see Mimi Calvati, who you may remember is my longtime poetry mentor, and who gave us a wonderful interview back in season two of the podcast. Mimi and I spent the afternoon going through the manuscript of my first poetry collection, which I'm pleased to say is nearly finished. The main thing I've still got to work on is a sonnet sequence, and I'm to blame for the fact that it's unfinished because I devised a fiendishly difficult technical structure for the sequence. And so I'm going to need to sit down and give that some sustained attention before it's done. Apart from that, I'm pleased to say that finishing the book is mostly a question of smaller bits and pieces of individual poems to adjust and fix and fine-tune. Now, when it comes to perceptive feedback, Mimi has the finest of fine-toothed combs, and she pointed out quite a few things that probably no one else on the planet would pick up, at least consciously. But that will make a difference if I can fix them. So it really shows the value, folks, of getting high-quality critique if you want to finish a piece of work to the very best of your ability. Anyway, I shall plough on with the collection and keep you posted on my progress. So watch this space. Today's theme is question everything, but don't forget to listen to the answers. When I was young, I questioned everything. Why does it get dark at night? Where does the sun go? Why do I have to go to bed? Why can't I be a dinosaur? Why do I have to go to school? When I grew up, I kept asking questions. Why are most people so miserable? What's the point of life when we all die in the end? Why do I have to get a job? Why don't we take time off during the week and work at weekends if we want to, or in the middle of the night instead of boring old nine to five? My curiosity led me into some interesting places. I spent time in therapy, meditating in monasteries, floating in the dark in sensory deprivation tanks, and working in all kinds of writing classes and and acting and personal development workshops. I also spent a lot of time as a psychotherapist, which turned out to be a great career move for somebody who liked asking questions. What do you want? What stops you getting it? What would you do if this problem disappeared overnight? What story are you telling yourself that makes the situation seem worse than it actually is? 
What other story could you start telling yourself about all of this? Why are you in a relationship with this person if you dislike them so much? If you like this person so much, how could you show it better? When I committed to being a writer, I had more questions. Can I really do this? Am I just wasting my time here? Why don't more people read my blog? Why do my poems keep getting rejected? All my life, I prided myself on my curiosity and my capacity to question things that most people took for granted. But after a while, I noticed that some kinds of questions made me frustrated, whereas others brought release. And eventually, I realised the big difference. There's no point asking a question if you don't listen to the answer. You don't have to agree with the answer or even accept it. But if you're just asking out of frustration or to annoy people around you or to criticise them or to avoid doing something you don't want to do, then it's really just another form of complaining. But if you do start listening to the answers, you can learn a lot about yourself as well as the world around you. Most people go to work for good reasons, to take care of themselves and their families, or because they haven't figured out a way to avoid it, or actually maybe they quite enjoy it. So if I was going to avoid getting a job, I would need to figure out a way of meeting my responsibilities by doing something else. It gets dark at night because the sun is away on other business. But it gives human beings a chance to press the reset button and make a fresh start. You can have your weekend in the middle of everyone else's week, but it's actually quite nice to have a break at the same time so we can enjoy it together. Most of those poems that got rejected weren't ready to see the light of day. It's actually a good job they didn't and so on. Whatever you do, never lose your curiosity. Never stop looking at the world afresh and asking the kind of questions only a child or an alien or an artist would think to ask. But don't do it to complain or to shift responsibility. And don't forget to listen to the answers. Because wherever you are, whatever you're doing, the answer to your question could well be right in front of you, staring you in the face. If you're enjoying the 21st Century Creative, you may like to know there is more to this podcast than meets the ear. To help you succeed in your creative career or business, I've created an in-depth programme, the 21st Century Creative Foundation Course. It covers the personal and professional skills you'll need to succeed as a creative professional in the 21st century. In other words, the stuff they probably didn't teach you at art school, on your creative writing masters, or wherever else you learned your craft. Things like how to manage your time, how to communicate your ideas, how to handle difficult conversations, how to close a sale, how to deal with money how to grow your network, and how to attract an audience for your work. Altogether, there are 26 lessons in the course, full of practical advice, plus a worksheet for each one to help you put the ideas into practice. And I'm giving you the entire course for free. In case you can't quite believe your ears, go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course and see for yourself. When you get there, you can sign up with just an email address and you'll get your first lesson right away. By the way, the course has already been taken by over 11,000 students. And on the sign-up page, you'll see lots of testimonials from other creatives whose lives and careers have been changed by the course. You can join them right now for free by going to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course.
Nadia Shireen is an award-winning and best-selling children's author and illustrator. Her books include Good Little Wolf, The Bumble Bear, The Cow Who Fell to Earth, and her latest, Billy and the Dragon, is released this summer. Nadia's books have given a lot of pleasure to me and my family, as my wife and I have read them with our children over the years, so I was really pleased that Nadia agreed to come on the podcast and talk about her work. If you love children's books, and who doesn't, then you'll find this a fascinating peek behind the curtain to see how they are made. It was really nice to discover that the magic of a picture book is also there in the creative process, as you can hear how much Nadia enjoys amusing herself during the writing and drawing process. Nadia also talks about some of the specific challenges and opportunities of writing for children and the importance of trusting and respecting their capacity to experience powerful emotions. Whether you're a writer or not, if your creativity depends in any way on working within an established set of formal constraints and making the most of them, then you'll likely find insights here that you can use in your own creative practice. I certainly came away from this conversation with a very different way of looking at the deceptively simple format of the children's picture book. And I noticed surprising parallels with my own art, poetry, and also with the challenges of screenwriting for feature films. Maybe you'll discover similar resonances with your own creative discipline. Are you sitting comfortably? Then relax and enjoy this journey into the world of children's stories with Nadia Shireen. Nadia, what possessed you to start writing children's books? <laughs> possessed is a good word. <laughs> um, uh, it, I took a really roundabout way to get here, to, to get to this career. Um, I've always been a daydreamer. I've always been someone that's enjoyed drawing, doodling. Um, I've always lived in my imagination a lot. It wasn't a career option I took seriously just because I don't think I was, I, uh, you know, I didn't grow up in that kind of household where, where that was necessarily, um, a creative career was necessarily um, considered to be a serious option. Like like many of my peers, you know, I don't know many people who, whose parents were like, yeah, you should definitely become a <laughs> That will pay well. Um, so it, it was just always there. It was just always something I did. And it was when I was about 30, I was working in the magazine industry and really feeling like, you know, this creative itch wasn't getting scratched. So I, I, I did a few evening courses in illustration, which then led me on to do an MA in children's book illustration part time. And I have to be honest, the only reason I did that MA was because it fit into my work schedule. So right. I, could, I could earn a living being a freelance journalist and then one day a week nip up to Cambridge it was at Cambridge School of Art nip up to Cambridge and do um, illustration and the children's book aspect of it was secondary to me which I'm sure the tutors wouldn't have been delighted to know but in the course you know whilst doing that course that that's really where my appreciation for the form came alive and I and I thought hey this is actually perfect this is the perfect combination for me. You know, I, I want to tell stories. I love language. Um, I love drawing. And there's some, there's a mysterious um, alchemy between these three things in the format of children's books. Does that answer the question in a long way? Yeah, it does. I'm just thinking, because in this country, mm. we're in the UK, stories with pictures for adults are kind of frowned upon, aren't they? It's not like in France where bon dessiné is, is revered or manga in Japan where you know, the grown-ups are reading it on the, the tube. You, yes, you, it's you, such you, a shame. I don't understand why, but we've got this idea that um, books or text and image working together is, is somehow infantile or stupid. And actually, it's, you know, it, there's a, there's, it's so rich because if you look at an image and there's some accompanying text, if it's done well, 
the text will not be repeating what the image is telling you. They, they will both right. be yeah. telling you slightly different things. There's a gap in between, and that's the gap that we fill in. You know, that's the gap that you fill in as a reader. And I think that there's so much potential in that gap and, and that you can exploit that gap in, in really interesting ways. But I don't know why we've suddenly decided that once you get to a certain age, that that's it. I think it's getting better. I mean, there there is graphic novels are, are becoming more popular and and respected as a as an art form. But I really want to pick up on on mm-hmm. this gap that you talk about, Nadia, because one of the things I really love about your books is when you read them, you've really got to pay attention to the illustrations because you you see stuff in the text and you you there's very often there's a telling little detail in the illustration, and I don't want to spoil any surprises. <laughs> that if you miss that, if you just turn the page too quickly, then you you kind of miss another dimension or yes. another joke. And that's, you know, you know. some parents have, have, have criticised me. Well, not criticised, but, you know, said, oh, I missed that the first time. And I think, well, it's just about slowing down. And, and it, you, you're, you have to, mm. like you say, you have to read the image to get the full picture. And that's where the, that's the fun of it. And also, if you're a kid, and maybe you know, my picture books have to appeal to children who cannot read, uh, and then children who are learning to read, and then children who can read comfortably, as well as teachers and parents. Um, there's a real joy to be had if you're uh, if you can't read yet, and your parent or whoever is reading you this story. You get to find some. You know, you're not just reliant on them. So for them to get some information from an image it feels a bit like I'm telling them a secret. Yes, yeah. And you, you've got to pay yeah. attention and attention mm-hmm. is rewarded. And it's, again, it's, I was rereading them this, obviously this week because I knew I was going to talk to you. And it, it's a very non-linear experience of reading. We're, we're so used to reading emails and texts and tweets and just getting the gist of it. Even with a novel, it's kind of you're, you're traveling yeah. in one direction. But when you read a picture book, you, you read and then you've got to look back at the image again in the light of what mm-hmm. you've just read. And it's it, it, you, you've got to read in several directions at once and, and like you say, slow yeah. down. And you need to, you know, it's it, pacing is an interesting thing that I deal with because I don't know if um, your listeners are aware, but picture book formats are pretty standard globally. You've got 32 pages. I wasn't aware. Tell, tell us about this. You've got 32 pages, pretty much. And that's that's pretty standard. Yeah. Um, that's just because of printing, uh, the, the way that, you know, the, the, the economies of printing. Yeah. And often um, picture books need to be sold to other countries to make any money back. Mm-hmm. So it's a very globally inter- interconnected uh, industry. So hence there are these these standards. You know, so 32 pages is your standard length. So within 32 pages, that's not much space in which to establish characters, um, establish a sense of uh, environment, you know, where is the story taking place, and then, and then give your reader a traditional story arc. So pacing is important because you need to ramp up the tension at points you need to slow your reader down at some points. An image can really help with that. So an intricate image or um, a, a couple of pages where, as you say, the words aren't telling you everything. I'm forcing the reader to slow down a little bit. Yeah. You know, so it's it's a real, it's, it's like directing a, a film almost. It, it's, it, there's, it looks deceptively simple, but actually you are kind of, the image and the words both dictate how long you stay on a particular page. And sometimes you want that, that, ter- that page turn to be quick mm-hmm. because of a funny joke yeah, or, or because you're trying to ramp up the action towards the end of your 32 pages. And then you want it to slow down so that your reader feels, even though they've only got two pages left, they have slowed down so they feel like that ending is satisfying. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And you're giving me a completely different way of looking at it. I mean, I'm kind of unconsciously, I'm really, you know, this is what I've done reading your books and other mm. picture books, but you're showing me the book through a different lens. And it's, you know, it's it's, it's quite cinematic. I mean, I'm thinking when, when I work with screenwriting clients, you know, they've got about 90 pages for their feature film. And that 
the format that's been well established in the industry. And yet that box gives them a space to innovate and, you know, pacing and character development and speed is is obviously critical there. But I hadn't I hadn't quite thought about a children's book in this way. But you're absolutely right when you describe it like that. Yeah, it's it's it makes it a challenging but really stimulating kind of environment to work in or medium to work within. Um there's something about when you when you've got quite a restricted template, it makes you more inventive in a way. Um, you're just trying to eat. You're trying to eat out everything you can to kind of tell your story, whether that's changing the background color of a page mm-hmm. to kind of indicate a change of mood or emotion, or kind of toying with where you put an ellipsis or or, or an exclamation mark. Um, everything counts. In a good picture book. Yeah, because everything's magnified when, when you're looking at it that closely and carefully. Obviously, I'm thinking of poetry here, because mm. if you write a short poem like a, a sonnet or a haiku, then every word really counts in, yeah. in, in a very different way than if you're writing a 80,000-word mm. novel. It's a balance, isn't it? It's a balancing it's, act. You know, the reader's eye is very unforgiving. Yes, yeah, absolutely. There's nowhere to hide. And, and every, you know, the weight of things really matters. Um, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in terms of its similarity to poetry, but that's definitely true. So what do you think makes a really good children's book? I mean, are there, are there any examples of other people's works that you would say, oh, well, that, that's someone I really look up to and admire, or that, that's a, a kind of exemplar of the craft? I don't know. It's so personal. I mean, I do you mean picture books or kind of children's books in a more broad yeah. sense? I mean, picture books, it's funny because people say to me, oh, you must have had loads growing up. And the truth is I didn't. Um, we were we were a house of readers, that's n- no doubt, but we would go to the library and my mum would, you know, get her Dick Francis or Agatha Christie and, and kind of I'd be free to do what I wanted in the children's area and I would just tear through them. Mostly I would tear through them there. So I didn't have loads in the house when I was growing up. I did, um, I loved uh, Jan Pakowski, who did the Megan Mod books. Um, oh, yeah, they them? were amazing. Oh, God, yeah. And oh, that takes me yeah, back. Yeah, he did Megan Mod, which I just loved, and Haunted House, which was this amazing kind of three-dimensional book. Like, you open it up and a frog jumps out of the toilet, that kind of thing. Um, so I loved those because they felt a bit, they were bright and bold. It felt a little bit forbidden because um, they were so different from the kind of genteel um, Hans Christian Andersen type picture books that would be thrust into your hand. These were quite kind of loud and punky. and I don't know. They were quite anarchic, weren't they? And quite, yeah. Quite edgy. And the drawings were deceptively simple. And the drawings, as a child, you, you kind of went, oh, I could draw that because they're really simple. And sometimes yeah. you can see that he's done them in felt tip. I love that. I still really love that. Um, so they were great. And then yeah, other picture, you know, in terms of the ones that loomed large, th- those loomed large for me as a child. And now, of course, I think, oh, there are so many. There are so many fantastic picture book artists working. But I try not to look at them because it depresses me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, people like Brian Wildsmith, you know, you've got these kind of uh, heroes who, who, who people who work well with color I mean contemporary people who work well with color would be people like Benji Davis is a contemporary picture book artist who I think does great things uh, Jim Field is I think one of the biggest selling picture book artists at the moment and pains me to say it but you know he really deserves it because his characterization is amazing we're, we're, it's a really rich time for picture books and I, I'm you know I'm I, I'm I am half joking when I say it makes me feel envious. It also makes me feel immensely proud um, yeah. that I'm working during this time. Um, I think it's really rich. You know, I think we're all looking at each other's work and, and enjoying it, and it, it, it pushes all of us on, I think. And all of your books, it strikes me, looking at them again, there's a really strong central concept to each one, like Good Little Wolf or The Bumble Bear or the cow who fell to earth where do you get the ideas um it's a funny one and how do you know that you've got a great an idea that you want to turn into a book 
I think it has to have a few elements. So there has to be an engaging character. So that comes just from me sitting at my desk with a pencil mm-hmm. or not even at my desk in bed with a sketchbook or, you know, wherever. I'm always drawing just characters just and just seeing who appeals, you know, when I draw a character and that character's looking at me. And I'm like, wow, you're definitely a separate entity. Then I think, okay, so that's 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 one factor. But then also I need to kind of be able to put them in a situation give them an interesting story. But I do want there to be a little bit of weight. You need to empathise. You know, I need to empathise with them. And I think maybe that's where the the weight that you're talking about comes from. It, it's not enough for me that you've got, like, a, a bear goes to the shops and buys a loaf of bread and comes home and makes a sandwich. Like, for there to be real, which is fine, but, like, for there to be real stakes, real tension, and then real love or real connection, I think you need to feel it does that sound that sounds really heavy and highfalutin no, it about a but, cow but, but you know i need to feel it i need to mean it at least well I, I think with any story really we've got to feel that this a it, it matters to the the central character that there's something at stake and therefore if, if we empathize and maybe see ourselves in them to a certain degree then it matters to us yeah absolutely and i think kids you know they kids can take that Kid, kids everything you know the kids go through such a roller coaster of emotions in one day and all the stuff matters so I take their emotions seriously I can kind of remember my I've got a good emotional memory I remember what it feels like to be a kid and all those feelings are just as valid and serious as they are now so I try and I, I want my books to be funny too I mean don't get me wrong you know ultimately I want kids to have a laugh and have a good time before bed and you know whatever and enjoy them but I do at the same time want to treat my characters with love and 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 respect well I mean there is quite a remarkable emotional range in your stories I mean you have people who are lonely who are feeling left out or rejected or or they're lost or or terrified frankly I mean good little wolf is um well, obviously, I don't want to spoil the ending, but it's 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 quite. Uh, when I turned that final page, I thought, "Whoa!" You know, it's it was quite shocking. Yeah. Was it shocking for you when you got the idea? Did you think, "Is this too much?" Or is it? Uh, for good little wolf. Yeah. Um, I no, not really. That was funny because that was my first book, and that was a book that I created when I was finishing my MA uh, at Cambridge School of Art. And I'd been I'd been failing that course. Like my tutor quite gleefully was kind of telling me, you're probably going to fail <laughs> uh, because I was working at the same time and it was just too much of a juggle. Um, but in the end, I took three months off work just so I could focus on, on, on my final push. So it wasn't created. Um, I didn't actually think it was, I, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is going to be published. I was thinking I need to finish my course. I need to get this book done. And I want it to, you know, I want it to be presented on my final degree show and, and get a good mark. Maybe that, maybe that liberated me because I, I wasn't, I had no experience of the children's book publishing industry world at that point. I don't know if I'd do it now. Maybe I'd be too cautious now. I'm not sure. But I think the fact that it was so um, surprising, that ending, really helped as yeah. a debut uh, picture book author because it, got, it really got me noticed. Well, I'm not surprised. I mean, it, it, again, with folks, you, you really need to read it. <laughs> and it, and it, it, it ends with a bang. That's all I will say. <laughs> and, uh, and the thing is, when my kids read it, I was like, well, what, you know, what, what will they think? But they loved it. I'm interested they in that. Did you did you leave it up to them to interpret the ending? I yeah, I didn't. I mean, I I wouldn't yeah. tell them what it means. That's the or, key, or, or whatever. It was just I'm I was just watching how they responded. So that's the key. Yeah. Well, you did absolutely the right thing. You know, I'm trying not to spoil it. <laughs> not that anyone yeah. is that bothered. I'm sure. <laughs> um, but I have had parents read it and go, "Oh, you got to the end and." I couldn't believe it. And I explained to little Timmy what happened and he was devastated. And I feel like going, well, don't explain then because you, <laughs> you know, it's up. If the child interprets that ending in a particular way, yeah. they're ready to, and they'll find right. it funny. 
if they are going to be upset by that, they will read something else into it. And I even help out that with there's another, if you turn the page again, there's another picture that can help that ending be plausible. Do you know what I mean? So I think the child sees the ending, it's ready to see. Um, but it's yeah, when, when parents get involved and, and explain things, um, maybe their kid's not ready for, then it has then I've had bad feedback. <laughs> right, but it sounds like it's more the parents. I mean, I blame the parents. Interfering with the story. Well, of course, with the parents, <laughs> of course. But they always get they always get the blame. And we are both parents, by the way, but yes. we, and we always get the blame. We always get the blame, it's fine. Um but I, I really do think that is a great example of, hey, it's really bold and you really trust your reader. You really treat the child with respect in being bold in that way. But then there's also that subtlety to it that if if they're ready for it, then they'll get yeah. this. And if they're not, then maybe they'll they'll take something else from it. Yeah, I'm on the side of my reader before anyone else. I'm on, I'm, I am on the kid's side. And I do think as a children's book writer or illustrator, you've got to be on the side of the kids. Um, and I naturally feel that. That's not a leap for me. Um, I want to challenge my readers, and maybe a little, but I never want to patronise them. I also don't want to traumatise them for no good reason. I, I don't like those books. You know, I don't like those cartoons or books or whatever that are set to shock or upset just for the sake of it. It's like you've got to have a good reason. Uh, or it's got to be done with wit or um, care. And again, n- nearly all your books, that there is a kind of a punchline. It's not necessarily as as dramatic as that one, mm. but there is a when you turn that final page, there is there's a moment of an emotion being expressed or or released that that you really do feel something is has been said that matters. How easy is it to get that? final page is it is it one of the first things you get or do you have to work for a while and then it and then you kind of it comes oh that's nice that you've noticed that because that's um that is something me and my editor andrea who i work very closely with you know she really helps me with pacing and we always talk about that page 32 that the final sign off (laughs) because it seems a shame (laughs) yeah it seems a shame always after you've gone through an adventure to just have a last page that either doesn't make you really feel anything um, or doesn't raise a smile. Or I mean, they're not always little jokes. Sometimes they do just underline a mood. Um, Billy and the Beast, which is my the, the most recent book that came out, you know, the final page is, is the lead character kind of wa- literally walking off into the sunset with, with her pals, but it's hopefully done in a way that just underlines, ties together, you know, as you say, leaves you with a strong feeling. Um, it's quite tricky sometimes. I'm, I always want to try and get an extra gag in, always. Um, you know, I like to shoehorn in as many jokes as possible. But it is quite tricky. Okay, okay. So it, that is something that is consciously worked out. Because it, it really, you know, again, it's one of the things that it leaves you with. It leaves you with a feeling. And it, it and it's a, a range of different feelings in the different books. But you really do feel, oh, when you put the book down, there's something yeah, that lingers with so. you. Yeah, I yeah, I hope so. I don't want to. I don't want to waste any space. You know that there's so little space. I want to kind of, I don't know, squeeze it. You know, squeeze it like a sponge. I wringe every last page out. For some, I don't. I don't mean cram every page full of stuff. I just mean use the entire book. You you know use my palette. Yeah. If you like, or or, or yeah, exploit my canvas. I mean, not my. Palette. Uh, exploit my canvas to the best of my ability. Another really bold move that you have that we can talk about because it's in the title is the cow who fell to earth. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, it's my I must... Bowie, it was my Bowie grief book, clearly. Ooh, right. Oh, really? That was, that, that, <laughs> was it written at that time? When he died? Yeah, well, weirdly. So weirdly, I had, I had a meeting set up, an editorial meeting, and before, you know, so what's the next book going to be? And I had a couple of sketchbooks and I had drawn a space cow with the words, the cow who fell to earth in my sketchbook. Mm-hmm. Pre Black Monday, as I like to call the day of Do- David. Black Bones Star there. Monday. Yeah. Black Star. Oh, very good. Pre Black Star Monday. Um, so it was there and I had the meeting on Tuesday, um, which was like, I was very tear stained. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I'm sorry. 
<laughs> my we, we heroes died. Yeah. Um, I was genuine. Yeah, we all were genuinely gutted. I know. I, I really was. And as we were flicking through the sketchbook, it was like, oh, who's this little space cow guy? And I was like, yes, we've got to do the space cow. And as much as, I mean, yeah. That Bowie is a, it's a cheeky nod to him, but the actual story is about something completely different. Okay, and I mean, I assume that everyone listening to this is a Bowie file, but just in case you you missed out on his cinematic masterpiece, it's it's the man who fell to earth, right? Is yeah. the movie, and it's again part of the boldness is that I mean that movie really isn't for kids. <laughs> no, <laughs> it it's isn't really for most not. adults. It's really not. <laughs> <laughs> it's really dark no. and scary. And, and yeah. um, and and weird, frankly, which is what makes it glorious. So, this is again. This was something I, I was thinking about because I've been reading Asterix with my son recently, and I always loved Asterix as a kid. Mm. And one of the things that Asterix does really well, and that something like the cow to, who fell to Earth does really well, it gives the parents something extra, but it mm. doesn't detract from the child's enjoyment. You know, like so in Asterix, there's a few political jokes or references to you know classical poems in Latin and stuff that right. the kids are never going to get. But the parent reading it goes, "Ah, oh, oh, I see what he's doing there. That's, yeah. that's nice." And it's like that. There's something yeah. for everyone in a book like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's. I think it's because I mean, as I say, my primary audience are, are the kids, and I'm on the side of the kids. It's more to amuse me. Because right. Um, right. I didn't call that book The Cow Who Fell to Earth because I thought I'd get a load of Bowie parents buying the book. Honestly, I didn't. Um, because that's a terrible idea. You know, that's a terrible thing to hand a picture book on. <laughs> is, I hope some parents are David Bowie fans. It would be quite niche. So it's more about me. That's more about just m- get, making myself laugh. And yeah, sure, like-minded people will get a laugh out of it as well or yeah. will get some satisfaction from it. But if I think if I went down the road of trying to shoehorn in stuff for the parents it oh i think i think you there's a danger of losing your focus on kind of who who your main audience is right and it certainly doesn't come across like that and i think that's a lovely answer that it's it's for your own amusement and i think that comes across you you obviously well i assume you enjoy doing these things because you know the books are full of joy and, oh, and I like yeah. that kind of exuberance that you just, when you put something, you just can't resist doing it. Well, yeah, I mean, what a luxury. This is my job. It's ridiculous. You know, I've had I've had normal jobs before this. And, yeah. and I feel, and I'm <laughs> great, I'm, like. I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, we're well, sort of normal. Um, but I feel stupidly grateful. I mean, I, I feel really grateful this hasn't been my only job because I can really appreciate what a joy it is to have this creative freedom. You know, I've got a whole book that I'm writing and illustrating myself. Who gets that? You know, who gets to have a a playground? So I'm going to enjoy it (laughs) while I'm doing it and and put stuff in that makes me laugh. Even if it doesn't make anyone else laugh, if it makes me laugh, that's something. Uh, I'm just turning the book over as as we talk. And on the back cover, it says, warning, this book is very (laughs) silly. (laughs) That's a perfect example. I was like, I really want a chicken holding a sign, a warning sign. Nobody else wants, you know, asked me to do that. Yeah. I just I just like that. It, kind it, of it wasn't necessary, which is kind of what, what makes it joyful unnecessary. and fun. Yeah. Okay, so what does the typical working day look like for you? Um, it's pretty it's pretty boring, but kind of pleasingly so. I mean the the best days are the ones where I just have to be at my desk all day in a way. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about my job is a brilliant but unexpected um, uh, side effect of my job is that I go into schools, I get involved in literary festivals, um, I am invited to various panels. Do you know what I mean? There's a a whole other Mm -hmm. side to the job that I wasn't anticipating that exists. So, you know, in a typical week I might have, you know, a couple of school visits or, or... I don't know, some extracurricular thing. Um, but that's great. Um, but but a joyful day is one where I, I get up, um, take my son to school, typically, um, come back, make a big cup of tea and get to play at my desk. Now, I'll be somewhere in the picture book cycle. Um, I'll either be trying to uh, 
figure out what the next book's going to be, which is an exciting but also quite terrifying time. And that's where I am at the moment. You know, I've got nuggets of ideas and I'm trying to develop them visually to see which one's going to be the one I work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, or, or I'll be later on in the process where I know what I need to do. The book is mapped out and I'm just going in to do artwork. Those days are quite interesting. Those days are quite heavy, but I like them. Those are the days that I'll, music is really important to me. So when I've got a day where I know what I need to do, so I know that I need to sit down and draw some mountains and some trees, for example, I kind of love it because I can just get stuck in. I can put some very weird (laughs) droney experimental (laughs) music on maybe or whatever and just get on with it. And that's brilliant. Um, I used to listen to the radio, um, but recently I found kind of speaking uh, listening to speaking too distracting. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can sometimes, you know, if, if, if it's purely visual and I'm not having to switch on the kind of narrative part of my brain, then I can listen to the radio. But, but generally I like to do that. And I just do that and because of like you mentioned, you know, we're both parents. Um, before I was a mother, I would do things like go for a nice long walk to clear my head and think about next steps. But now that's not that's just not part of my reality because now it's I cram in as much as I can before um, end of the end of the store day. And what's the relationship for you between the the creating, you know, the writing, the illustrating, and and the business professional side of it? Do you do you enjoy both sides, or do you you know some some artists say oh, I just want to be in the studio all day and mm. I hate having to do any marketing or promotion? What well, what's your attitude to that? Mm, I actually I actually enjoy both sides because look you know 80% of my job is me in the studio yeah so most of my work is solitary and I'm um I'm one of those people that likes people around I don't necessarily like to be talking all the time with people but I like them nearby Mm -hmm. you know I was very used to I used to work in magazines so very noisy offices and I'm quite like that hubbub um at the same time I can be very insular you know within that hubbub so I like it it's you know I like it it's um it's fine I don't find it a particular chore I enjoy yabbering that's why I'm on this podcast with you you know I, I and I get a lot from other people I love you know just chatting I, I get lots of inspiration from other people and motivation because as a sole practitioner and you'll know this you have to be everything right you have to be your line manager yeah. you have to be your own work experience girl you have to be your own trainee <laughs> you have to be everything and and so different you have to wear different hats at different times and it's nice to interact with other people and and, and, and get some help I like it if I'm chatting to um a PR person or something or a bookseller and they're telling me about their the kind of how their role interacts with what I do I find it really comforting it reminds me that I'm part of a bigger network and we've talked, obviously, we've focused mostly on your your books, but you do other things as well. You you illustrate for other people, and you do some amazing prints as well. The the oh, like that's the fox. The lo, talking of Bowie again. The fox low yeah. cover is just fantastic. So, can Thank you maybe you. talk about some of the other things you do around the books? Yeah. So every now, you the, the I, I do do just. I think it's really important because I'm on treadmill, such a negative word. So I don't, I shouldn't say treadmill. I need to think of a better word. I'm on a schedule, I suppose, with my picture books. Yeah. Um, it's like if you're in a band, you know, you do an album and tour. It might be, I suppose it's, that's a bad analogy. It's not like that. Now. Um, and it's really important to every now and then do something else just to keep your creative juices flowing, to keep interested. So I've always been open to trying new things. When I do prints, like the Bowie Fox print you're talking about, um, that's because I have a deep primal urge to do an image. I'm like, I must create this. And I don't know where that comes from, but I've learned that when that comes, it, 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 it serves me well to listen to it. Now, that image I create might just sit on my desk or in a sketchbook or on my computer if I'm doing it dig- digitally. Or it might like the like certain images. I might think, hey, I could I could sell this as a print. But I, I try to always listen to it. Um, 
or it might come out in a piece of creative writing or um you know, I, I try as I say I try and say yes to stuff that makes me feel even if it makes me nervous so I'll say yes to doing a podcast or you know interviewing someone or, or whatever um it just keeps it interesting for me and so what's next for you what's going to keep it interesting for you in the future loads actually <laughs> loads at the minute um annoyingly quite a lot that I can't talk about because it's speculative mm-hmm. um but but you know definitely more picture books are happening which I'm really happy about and I am pressing my nose up against the window of other forms mm-hmm. I probably can't not because I'm like I don't think I'm like uh you know Madonna or anything but it's just but it's just it's just I, I don't want to jinx them because okay, no, none no. of them have no, nothing's been uh, signed on the dotted line. But okay, don't but, don't jinx know, anything. Just c- come back and tell us anything. about it in future. Yeah, that would be great. But you are exploring other avenues as well. Yes. Your... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm kind of looking at. Um, I just kind of think I'm. You know, I feel quite liberated by being at the stage of life, middle aged, and uh, mortality is you know looms large. <laughs> <laughs> it always has for me. It always has for me. I've always been death obsessed. But, you know, I'm, I'm always like, uh, I'm, our time is limited and I want to do as much as I can and, and not worry so much about if I'm entitled to. I think in the past I've been worried like, oh, you can't do that. You can't become that kind of writer or you can't suddenly go into this sphere because you're not entitled. And now I just think, oh, to hell with it. Do what I want. And if someone wants to stop me, they can have a go and, well, I, years ago, my friend Chris Arnold, who works in advertising, said to me, you should always always get forgiveness rather than permission. That's such a good, I'm going to try and remember that. So true. Oh, really? Oh, I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that's brilliant. I'm going to nick that. Yeah, because I've, I've, I've been very much the other way. Like, oh, I'm so right. sorry. I mustn't do that. I mustn't do that. I'm not serious enough. Or, oh, I just draw bears. That's the, that, That's the... Um, kind of self-disparaging uh, line I use a lot to get out of things like oh I don't know silly old me I just draw bears and actually it's <laughs> and actually quite... that's a, that's a very serious undertaking as we've seen it's a serious undertaking so if somebody's listening to this thinking you know what I've always thought I could I have an idea for a children's book or I thought I would be good at that kind of thing what do you have any advice for them on on where to go with that I think it's I think um you know, a thing that would be really helpful, because I get quite a few emails of that nature, mm-hmm. and I always think the best thing I can say is get to know your market a little bit, because the children's book market is you've got picture books, you've got middle grade books, you've got now young adult books. They, these categories have kind of arisen rightly or wrongly. But it's important that you get to know what's out there and try and understand where you're story fits because sometimes people come to me with kind of chapters and chapters and I say well I'm, I'm a picture book writer and artist so this is completely not my wheelhouse this is a different thing mm-hmm. so just a little bit of research can go such a long way in helping you then look at your story and go oh actually I think this would suit this would work well as a chapter book with black and white illustrations or hmm, actually maybe it's more a baby board book you know and and that can really help and that can help you when you then come to describe it to potential agents or interested parties. They'll really appreciate the fact you've done your homework. Yeah, I mean, again, coming thinking of screenwriting, writing, mm. they, when it comes to pitching a, a movie, then you've got to be able to describe it very clearly and succinctly. You know, what is the idea in a way that someone can get that very clearly? And it sounds like it's very similar with a, a children's book. I think so. And I presume with a screenwriter, you've also got to show, demonstrate that you understand the restrictions of the form right, of screenwriting. Right. So, for example, if you think I've got a great idea for a picture book, then be aware that picture books are 32 pages long. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Kind of have a, have a think about that. <laughs> it's not, it's, before gonna, it's you... not going to be a 500 page epic. No, but you'd be surprised at kind of <laughs> the assumptions people make. And it's like really get to know, so get to know the very dull mechanics of the format you're trying to break into because that will serve you really well and save everyone's time or save your time as well. And again, I think as, as you've shown today really delightfully at the, 
at the beginning of the conversation, those apparently dull mechanics are very often the key to the magic of it. Yeah, absolutely. When you talked about the 32 pages and the, the pacing, it really showed me it in a new way. So if you're thinking of getting into this space, then really do go back and listen to what mm. Nadia was saying about the format and the form. Yeah, and it's uh, it's joyful. I mean, it is. It's not meant to sound. It is restrictive, but there's there's pleasure in kind of you know butting up against those restrictions and seeing what you can do with it. I think I think that's a great way of kind of. I'm sure you discussed this on other episodes. It is an ongoing thing. A great yes. a great way of unleashing creativity is to have some restriction. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about pleasure butting against restrictions. I think this would be a good yeah. time to introduce your creative challenge, Nadia. Yes, my creative challenge is really quite simple, um, but again, deceptively so. So one of the challenges I come across, you know, day in, day out, really, is how to inject a sense of play into something that's also my job. Right. And I think that's challenging whatever sphere you're working in, is that, you know, we are often at our best when we are, when we kind of, we find that flow and we feel playful and we stop frowning and we stop clutching our pen really hard. You know, it's a very simple thing. If you're drawing and you're tense, you'll notice that even the way that you hold your pen or pencil quite, you can feel the stress and the tension in that. Nothing good is going to come out of that pencil yeah, or yeah. that pen. Um, my challenge is to, just to give yourself half an hour and maybe a sheet of A4 paper and a pen or a pencil and just let yourself play. Um, and that sounds really kind of fluffy. But I mean, really see if you can let go, doodle, create, and not worry about the outcome. So don't look down and go, that's wrong. That doesn't look like a tree or that's a rubbish horse. Um, <laughs> that's not really the point. The point is to kind of play, just yeah. get back into that playful feeling. We all did it when we were kids. We all picked up crayons and made a big mess on a, on a bit of paper and we didn't care about it. We just enjoyed the feeling of doing it. And I think it might be an interesting exercise to see if you could tap into that again. That's lovely. So just so we're clear, this is when you're under pressure in, in some way, maybe you've got a deadline or a big performance about coming coming up, or you're just getting stressed out about trying to, to be the best you can, then just take out the pens and pencils and crayons and, uh, and do a bit of scribbling, even if you're like me and you wouldn't remotely consider yourself an artist. You don't have to consider it. No one else has to see this. It's not, honestly, that, that's the key, is that you need to let go of that kind of, the battle we have with our own ego about kind of what we come up with at the end. It can literally just yeah. be stripes, shapes, and join the movement of kind of moving your hand around um, and, and seeing if you can relax kind of in that way. Um, yeah, it might it might work, it might not. But I, I, th I think removing any expectation of what you think a successful drawing looks like is key to this exercise. Lovely. Well, I shall be doing that at the next opportunity. I look forward to the next time I feel stressed <laughs> at work so I can do this. And I'm, I'm sure our yeah. listeners will have fun and joy doing it too. So. so, Nadia, your books, at least here in the UK, where every time I walk into the children's department of a bookstore, I see your books. Um, so people Hello. should obviously go rush to their nearest bookseller and get them. Where else can people go to engage with you and your work and your books? Um, so, yeah, my books, are, they are sort of some of the titles are sold internationally, some aren't. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a bit scattershot. But if you, yeah, um, go to your local tax paying bookshop and I'm sure they can uh, <laughs> advise you on what titles they have. My latest book was Billy and the Beast. Uh, this year, the sequel, Billy and the Dragon, uh, will be out in August. Um, just happened into the kind of groundswell of dragon interest. That's Game of Thrones. Um, I'm not. That's a joke. <laughs> nothing had nothing to do with that. I do have a website, but I'll be honest, I've not really updated it in a while. Um, so that's, I am on that, that's what Twitter. Nadia Shireen Draws dot org. Nadia Shireen Draws dot com. There's not a lot on there, but you okay. can have oh, we'll, a look. We will link there to that. We'll there are a few There are a few pics. Um, I, I do witter on on Twitter, but I can't pretend that that's. Oh, um, honestly, you, you, know. you have rubbish. You have to follow Nadia on Twitter. She's oh, you don't she's really <laughs> she's really funny. 
there's not much about work on there. There's well, not much about makes work. It's funny and, and yeah. engaging, and it's and it's really not for kids a lot of it, but it's it's great. No. It's very Nadia. She's one of I the. Bank one on of, their not, I bank on there. I bank on there not being five year olds on Twitter. Yeah, so yeah well, it's I don't, probably friendly. not yet. No, but but you are one of the people who makes me smile on Twitter. So mm. so definitely follow, and, and we'll put all the links in the show notes as usual, and maybe okay. an illustration or two so you can see the the magic for yourself. You know, illustrators are meant to be on Instagram, and I am, but I just I'm rubbish. I'm really bad on that, but I am on that as well. But the pictures are um, not rubbish, so we'll, maybe we'll link to that too. And also, what about your <laughs> prints? Have you, have you got a link for the prints that we can put in the show notes? Yeah, yeah so the prints, I've got an Etsy store, which is um, in my Instagram bio, and it's also on my Twitter page. Uh, the Bowie Fox prints have sold out, but I do have some... No. I know, I'm so sorry, but I do have some other... Um, I've got some horror movie homages at the moment. Ooh. So if you're a fan of like The Shining and Don't Look oh, Great, that's and, exactly what, that's exactly that what the thing. children's illustration sector is missing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so if you want to see a little kitten hold in a red mac holding a knife. Uh, and who, and who wouldn't poster, want to see that? Who wouldn't want to see that, then head over to my Etsy page. Brilliant, brilliant. We will do all of that. Nadia, thank you so much. As always, it's a delight to talk to you and I'm you. really glad you've made the time to to share your your words of wisdom and 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 your silliness with with my listeners who I'm sure will enjoy and appreciate as much as I do. It's been lots of fun. Thank you. You have been listening to the 21st Century Creative, hosted by Mark McGuinness. You can find the notes for today's show with more information about my guest and links to the sites we mentioned, as well as all the backlist episodes of the podcast at 21stCenturyCreative.fm. If you enjoyed the show, I do hope you'll subscribe in iTunes, and I'm always grateful if you could take a couple of seconds to just go to the iTunes podcast app and give the show a rating. If you'd like to have the 21st Century Creative Foundation course delivered to you for free, giving you 26 lessons of advice and worksheets on carving out an original creative career, you can sign up for the course at 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash free course. And if you are an experienced creative and you're curious about getting my help as a private coaching client, then the first step is to go to 21stCenturyCreative.fm slash coaching questions and answer the questions on that page. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll join me again soon.